There was once a famous baseball player named Roger Maris. At one time, he held the record for most home runs hit in a season. After he died, they asked his widow what it was like to live with such a great ball player. And she said with a sly smile, he didn't give me any trouble. <laughs> so that was how she judged a husband, whether or not he gave her any trouble. Well, by that standard, I'm here today to tell you that Douglas Townsend gave me a lot of trouble. <laughs> but it was good trouble. It was creative and productive trouble. It was energetic and beautiful trouble. And I'm grateful to Douglas for recruiting me to join up on his artistic journey in the last seven years of his life. I met Douglas when he was already 84. I was 61. I guess most women would generally dismiss an 84-year-old as too old. But as all the women here today who knew him can tell you, he didn't seem that old. <laughs> he had a twinkle in his eye that was unmistakable. And he had the energy, ambition, and restlessness of a younger man. When I first met Douglas randomly at a restaurant, I was instantly attracted to him. The fact that he was a composer definitely piqued my curiosity because I had never personally known any com uh, living composers. The only composers I knew of were dead. So I was cautiously intrigued, but definitely attracted. Yes, from the beginning I adored Douglas. He was a true artist, a man who spent each day knowingly experiencing life and expressing himself about it. <laughs> Composing may have been his highest form of self-expression, but he had more common ways also like talking, and talking, and talking, and talking. He talked to tenants and maintenance people in the building, to students in classes, to mothers and their children on buses and subways, to waitresses and diners, to musicians, rushing with their instruments on the street. Douglas expressed himself to all these people, whether he knew them or not, all the time. He told them about his music. He told them about his social networking concerts and his YouTube channel. Once I saw a message on his YouTube channel that said, I met Douglas on the subway and he told me to watch his video. <laughs> I urged, uh, he urged all these people to express themselves creatively. Write a memoir, he would say. Uh, learn a language, play an instrument. He would say this to some poor tired worker suffering through a rush hour commute. And if you were a woman, so much the better. <laughs> Douglas loved women. He truly liked them. He enjoyed talking to them. He empathized with them. And they liked him back. The women got Douglas. His charm, his non-aggressive, nurturing intelligence. He loved them, and they loved him. And I did too. And then, of course, Douglas loved the young people. He loved their curiosity, their openness, and their optimism. He understood them, their vulnerabilities, their hopes, and their needs. He loved to teach them and help them. He was a gentle and very patient mentor, and he loved their world, the world of today. He wasn't one of those old people who moan and groan about how everything has changed for the worse and there's no privacy and life isn't worth living anymore. No, he loved today's life. He fit right in with it. He thrived on it. He was truly a public figure. He had almost 3,000 Facebook friends. He had a YouTube channel. Like a social historian or anthropologist, he realized that we were in a transitional time with a lot of change occurring. He realized that the technological revolution was a social revolution, where the old elite private institutions were losing power to the cyber street and the bloggers. He didn't bemoan that. He wasn't invested in those private institutions anyway. He saw that a new social order was being created right now, and it excited him to be part of it. He wanted to live for 50 more years, to see how and where it all came out. But in the end, it was always the music that was his passion. And for me, it was truly inspirational to watch him in action every day. This man did music for 75 years. That is a long time to do something. That is almost a century. You have to love what you were doing to do that. Douglas read scores at night like other people read books. He heard the music in his head. He didn't need the radio, the TV, the CDs, or the MP3s to hear the music. When he wrote the music, he didn't need a piano or a computer or a keyboard to assist him in hearing the music. He heard the music in his head 
and he wrote it down. All Douglas needed in this life to be happy was a box full of pencils, lead, and erasers on the one hand, and some composition paper in the other. And then when he had finished the composition that he heard in his head, he would go looking to bring it to life for the rest of us. Not for himself, because he already heard it, but for us. He wanted us to hear the music he heard. And this is why he loved rehearsals so much and why he loved musicians so much. Because they were the necessary component to make his music come alive in the world and to the world. Without orchestras, symphonic bands, chamber ensembles, his self-expression could not be passed along to the rest of us. It could only remain within him. So this is why he cherished performances of his music. So we could hear the music and hear his highest form of self-expression. He wanted to talk to us with his best self. And he wanted us to listen and like and accept his offering. So this afternoon, for a short time, we will hear some of Douglas's self-expressions in a few of his chamber works. He always told me that he thought his greatest strengths were as a composer of music for a symphonic band or orchestra. And indeed, many of the works on today's program do come in a full orchestra or string orchestra version. In many ways, the music you will hear is like the man. Simple on the surface, not so simple underneath. I can't tell you how many musicians I have watched fall into a trap of looking at a Townsend score and saying, oh, this is simple. <laughs> then they start to rehearse it and they go, oh, <laughs> uh, why does it keep changing the rhythm all the time? <laughs> One day I asked Douglas if he thought he, his music was great music or if he thought he was a great composer. He immediately said that only time could reveal who is a great composer and only time can reveal which works are great works. He said he was a very good composer and knew his craft well, but that he couldn't say any more than that. He didn't seem at all upset about that, and as I thought about his answer, I realized that he composed primarily for self-expression and communication, not for an abstract goal like greatness. He composed because he had to compose, because he was an artist who had to express himself and that he found this way of doing it, through composing music that he hoped we would all listen to and like and accept as part of the culture. So that's what we're doing today, Douglas. We're listening to you talk to us through the medium of your beautiful and emotionally engaging music because we love you and we know this is what you would want. No farewells to you today, Douglas. You are always right here with us in your music as you always knew you would be.